The Zooier Than Thou podcast contains mature content and language and may not be suitable for younger audiences. Thanks for your understanding. Zooier Than Thou is on. You can join the howl. Zooier Than Thou is on. You can join the howl. Greetings, friends and fellow zoos, and welcome to the first of a three-part collection of episodes exploring the way the law perceives the relationship between humans and non-human animals through the lens of Western legal traditions. I'm Fausti, and I'll be your legal chaperone through all three of these episodes of our podcast. And I'm standby legal advisor Toggle, co-host and co-founder of Zooier Than Now. First off, a few procedural points. One, this episode is decidedly late. The full moon came and went last week, which is normally our zoo signal for each full episode's release. This lateness is entirely my fault. Which, for anyone who knows Fausti, is not at all an unusual circumstance. That's true, and that is a fair criticism. Timeliness may be a virtue, but I still suck at it. (laughs) I'm always trying to improve, but I'm late improving, and I'm always not really improving, actually, at all. When it comes to timeliness, my apologies for that. In this instance, my own tendency towards tardiness has crossed over with a torn tendon in my hip and a cracked tooth, Each has a boring story behind it, and each will be fine with a bit of time. And together, these things have made my lack of timeliness even worse than usual. Mm, I mean, there's some other things going on in your life, Fausti, so it's not all bum hips and bad teeth. Cancer, family obligations, schoolwork, a new startup company. All true, though none of it is an excuse for my lateness in getting this episode done. That lateness is, in a word, inexcusable. Okay. That said, second procedural point, this Legal Beagle episode is, as I mentioned, the first in a three-part series exploring how the law impacts and is impacted by the zoo community. This being the introductory episode and an overview, the second episode focuses on defensive tactics for zoos targeted by the legal system, the criminal system, broadly speaking, and the third reviews opportunities for zoos to play active, forward-looking roles in the development of future legal standards and in particular in the ways in which the law frames and protects or fails to protect our non-human peers. This is a topic near and dear to your heart, Fausti, one that you've been looking forward to tackling since before we even recorded the first episode of Zooier Than Now. Yep. For those unfamiliar with the backstory, (laughs) I myself was entangled with the legal system of the United States at the federal level in criminal proceedings targeting me due to my status as a zoo and as an acknowledged community activist for the better part of a decade. I have spent, give or take, four years behind the razor wire in federal prison due to my sexual orientation as a zoo and due to my refusal to renounce the zoo community in federal court. And I am consequently intimately familiar with how it feels to be in the crosshairs of anti-zoo bigotry wrapped in the robes of legal procedure. Listeners interested in the details of those experiences can find them laid out in gruesome detail in the book Uniquely Dangerous, written by investigative reporter Kareen Maloney. We've linked to it in the program notes or our website is simply uniquelydangerous.com. The book took her eight years to write, and it documents the hell Fausti has been through due to his activism in support of non-humans and the zoo community. It's a, it's a hard, dark book to read, and listeners should be warned that reading it can be particularly painful for anyone, and for zoos in particular. Fausti's dogs were murdered after being stolen by police, his horses were subjected to terrible abuses, well, let's leave it there. If you want to know more, Uniquely Dangerous is where to go, and if I may, um... As a zoo, uh, despite all of the hardships and horrors in there, I actually did find it rather empowering. Uh, and it's part of the reason why I wanted to do the podcast in the first place. So I definitely, despite the darkness of it, I definitely recommend checking it out. I appreciate that uh, summary, Toggle. Mm-hmm. Uh, point being, with regards to this episode, in addition to my academic background, and to be clear, as I discuss in more detail below... I am not a lawyer by trade, though I have done a fair bit of work academically in the legal field, and I may yet finish off my JD degree at some point. I have sat myself in courtrooms and been pilloried by a federal judge for being a zoo, a judge who, years later, actually admitted his mistake in doing so. Legal questions are near and dear to my heart, both generally and as a zoo in particular. 
these three episodes of Zooier Than Thou are an opportunity to share some of my own experience and hard lessons learned, as well as to provide an overview of how we can leverage legal tools as zoos and as a community to make a better world for humans and non-humans alike in the future. For tonight's episode, we're introducing some basic legal concepts and setting the stage for the subsequent deep dives into specific areas of the law. This overview is a great opportunity for those of you who aren't legal geeks to refresh your understanding of the most essential concepts of our legal system so that you can build on that in the next two legal episodes down the road from here. Right off the bat, it's important to be crystal clear that we're focusing almost exclusively on what is generally referred to as English common law. This is broadly the legal system to be found not only in England itself and in the Commonwealth countries such as Canada and Australia, but also in many other related systems, including that in most of the United States, except Louisiana, which is Napoleonic law, which is a whole nother fascinating subsection wow, really? we're not going to be reviewing That's here. Insane. Indeed it is. It is actually Code Napoleon in Louisiana, which is fascinating. Mm. <clears throat> that said, I'm not claiming that these uh, English common law based systems are the most important areas of legal theory or of legal practice. I'm not saying that at all. However, they're the only areas that I can talk to with any degree of expertise. I know almost nothing about Code Napoleon or any other legal systems to be found in the world. And as such, I'm going to focus here rather than do a poor job trying to summarize how these concepts might be set forth within other non-English legal systems. I'm simply unqualified to do that. Hopefully, mm. we'll be able to bring in experts in other legal systems to cover these areas as they are to be found in other areas of the world in future episodes. Meanwhile, we're starting here, but not of any argument that this is uh, the most important or otherwise the best place in terms of legal systems in general, more that this is a place where we have a, a toehold and an ability to begin the discussion. Right. That's an important point to remember for all of our listeners who aren't living in places where English common law is the rule of the land. Correct. And again, to be crystal clear, I want to make a point that is unambiguous and, to repeat myself, crystal clear. I am not an attorney, neither in the United States nor in Canada, nor anywhere else. I have not been admitted to practice law in any jurisdiction. I am not a member of the bar in any jurisdiction, and I do not practice law professionally. There are many great lawyers out there, some of whom are good friends of mine. I hope to interview several of these lawyers in future episodes within this legal exploration we're pursuing in our three-part series on the law. I am not one of those lawyers, however, though in the future, that time will tell if that changes. Meanwhile, I am a civilian non-lawyer talking about legal concepts. There's nothing wrong with that. Non-lawyers discuss the law all the time. However, I do not want anyone listening to misinterpret my discussion and advice on this and future podcasts as being provided by a professional attorney. I am not that. Okay, Fausti. It sounds like maybe this is a bit of a thing for you. Yeah. And there's a story. It's a long and convoluted story. It is covered in some detail in the book Uniquely Dangerous. So I'll leave it to listeners curious for more to dive into the weeds of why I always work to ensure clarity in this regard of mm. making my point as a non-lawyer explicitly clear. Also, it is important to understand that I am actually not a lawyer. And if you are facing substantive legal questions, it is absolutely essential for you to get professional legal advice. Do not listen to somebody on a podcast who is not a lawyer and think that that will be the way you should make decisions about, for example, a legal case that involves you or someone you love. Right. And I do actually remember that story. So, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and finally, before we really dive into the discussion, Fausti and I have decided to make use of a format for these episodes that's different from our usual full moon practice. Rather than a mix of discussion and skits, you know, Ask Zooey, our secret zoo segments and whatnot, we're sticking with a focus on the legal questions with a specific focus. Again, focus, <laughs> focus, 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 must focus. focus. <clears throat> Again, yep. Given how important these legal topics are to all of us, both as zoos and as activists working for the well-being and safety of our non-human peers, we have made the decision to zero in and keep a tight legal focus, focus again, focus, focus for focus. these three episodes must focus on legal concepts. It's well worth the temporary variance from our usual broader zooier than thou format. And we hope that you find these three episodes to be both entertaining and informative. And that is our goal in focusing on the legal concepts here. All right. So without further ado, let's dive in. Excellent. 
and true to a more legalist type of approach, let's get rolling with a quick overview of what we're going to do in this first introductory episode. As we said earlier, this is a review episode on legal concepts. In it, we're going to go over bullet point one, a brief history, <laughs> very brief history of English common law. Bullet point two, the distinction between statutory and common law. Bullet point three, the distinction between civil and criminal law. Notwithstanding these considerations, it is our position that additional subjects can and may arise as we explore these fundamental categories and we reserve the right to engage more deeply such subjects if and when they arise hereafter. Oh, God, yikes. It's Faustian legal speak mode. Oh, that's a thing, apparently. Yeah, indeed it is. <clears throat> and before we dive into that alternative universe of legalese more fully and focus, focus. focus on legal focus. concepts, let's take the opportunity to go over our reader submission for this episode. We've chosen one particular submission. It's a long one. Oh, and yeah. we think well worth the investment of time as it really sets the stage for much of what we're actually discussing in these upcoming legal episodes that we're mm -hmm. focusing on. Focus, focus. I'll read the first half and hand over the second half to you. Sound good? Perfect. Without further ado, the rat has the floor. This email is from Kisses for Bitches. Always lovely. Uh, Kisses for Bitches writes, Sorry, this is a long one. Yes, it is. You guys are awesome. I've been binging on your podcast to get caught up for the past two days. I love it. I love you and your on-point pro zoo presence online and on Zooville. Basically everything you represent and stand for or against. Well, very flattering. Thank you. Uh, we are honored. Yeah, and I'm sorry I'm not on Zooville since the, uh, as much since they uh, revamped yes. their site. I need to get back in there. Uh, this message is yes. usually all about love and acceptance and anti-bigotry. I am a zoo. And believe it's not something you choose to be or can just one day decide to become. You just are or you aren't. To accept or embrace it or not are the choices we have. I was born this way and accepted as soon as I realized it, but I would never, ever tell anyone outside of the safety and anonymity of online communities. Maybe on my deathbed, but <laughs> I personally don't think zoo sexuality will ever be accepted by society as an okay sexual orientation. To be a zoo is to accept a life of secret relations. Take your opportunities when they come up, have relationships with animals as if they are equals, but don't dare allow yourself to ever get caught or even incite suspicion. Still, the LGBT folks struggle endlessly to be seen as normal. Many people still see LGBT relations as against nature. Just like with Trump supporters, a culture of racism, misogyny, and bigotry, people are just not going to listen to reason or facts or our side of the argument. It's just sick and wrong to have a sexual connection with animals. I know right now that if I told my family I was gay, I'm not, but as an example, very few would truly be okay with it. Some of them would be like, good for you, be who you are on the inside, and then would avoid me like the plague. Others would want to save me from an eternity in hell. My parents would have been totally cool with it. Uh, some of my few outwardly gay family members. But that's about it. To the rest, I would be one of those people. Mm. But come out as a zoophile? That would just be insane. With LGBT, I think most of the progress with acceptance is because, at the very least, the relationships are still within our species. Society's come a long way with reluctantly saying those orientations are legit and should be seen as okay. But haters and bashers still target anyone who is not hetero for discrimination, or worse. Sodomy laws still exist in many states, and in some countries you can still be killed for being gay and nobody will be prosecuted for it. Businesses are being allowed to refuse service based on moral beliefs of the owners or operators. So now we step away from LGBT and consider zoo sexuality. We are stepping outside of our species for meaningful, loving, and sexual relationships. Nope. Not okay. Unless you are a zoo, you're likely not going to understand or come to terms with it. The majority of people do not see animals as equals. Animals as food, are trained as workers, helpers, and are guardians that we control mm. or seen as just a part of a food chain necessary to support us superior beings. Mm. But they are largely disposable. If animals don't behave as we like, they are discarded or killed without a second thought. Just within the past 200 years, and still today in some places, you could be killed in horrible ways, or imprisoned for even being suspected of having sex with an animal, for being an abomination against nature and God, or possessed by dark forces. The animals are killed as well, as if the creature had been ruined by the act, no longer fit for consumption, work, companionship, or apparently life. 
or the animal was a devil in disguise. Hell, we live in a world where female circumcision is still a thing. Some people inaccurately compare it to male circumcision. The real equivalent for men would be like having the head of your penis completely cut off, not just the foreskin. Kisses for Bitches continues from there. Honestly, I'm not trying to be discouraging. All people should stand up against bigotry and uneducated self-righteousness in any form. The people who are like, I believe what I believe and think what I think and will violently defend it regardless of the facts or reality are, in my opinion, the worst example of humanity. The worst being those with real power and or skill, but tiny minds, that are compelled to crusade for the destruction of the lives of good people they don't even care to know or hear their side. Extinguish those who don't think and believe as they do for their own self-satisfaction or reassurance, but under the guise of being a, quote, warrior for good, unquote. I think most people are for a live and let live, love and let love society, but are often afraid to show support because they don't want to be seen as, quote, one of those people, unquote. I fear that if the LGBT movement is any indicator, there is a long, long, long road ahead for Zeus, possibly without end. For the most part, we have to keep our sexual orientation secret, Kisses for Bitches argues, hidden and socially reserved to online communities where we can remain mostly anonymous. Just thinking about my own life, if I were to publicly announce I'm a zoosexual, it would profoundly change my life, but not in a good way. Those who love me would still love me, but I would immediately be drenched in the stigma that comes with such an extreme departure from, quote, the way things should be, unquote. It would affect one's very ability to walk down the street without people avoiding, shunning, or harassing you, because it's okay to be like that to an animal fucker. That's what we are to the majority of non-zoos, Kisses for Bitches argues. We are not seen as animal lovers, we are animal fuckers. He continues from there. I'm just saying, there are a lot of people, especially religious ones, that will simply never come around to acceptance or even tolerance of LGBT sexuality. So it seems like an impossibility for zoo sexuality to even be considered as a genuine orientation. To them, we are only a notch above pedophiles because we molest animals rather than human children. In the eyes of the, quote, moral majority, unquote, we will likely always be seen as abusers and rapists. People don't believe that an animal can desire or crave sex with a human or provide real consent. They are just dumb animals acting on instincts related to biology and hormones telling them that it's time to reproduce. Or the animal fears that if they don't submit and do what their quote unquote owner wants, they will be punished because that's how we've conditioned them throughout history with domestication. Anyhow, my hat's off to you and those who stand in the light and say, we're here, we're valid, and we aren't going anywhere. You are brave and you are champions. He says, I couldn't do it, but I will always stand up against bigotry, hatred, and self-righteous assholes in the online arena where we should be safe from hatred and petty persecution. Why can't people just live their simple, close-minded lives and leave those who they don't understand the fuck alone to be happy? But many can't, it seems. Those who do not conform to normal, natural, man-on-woman relationships, and in some cases monogamy and just sex for procreation only, will always be acceptable outlets for those people's hatred. Normal, but indifferent, tolerant, slash accepting people will just look the other way simply because they don't want to get involved and be tarnished in the eyes of their peers as a supporter of abnormal or unnatural sexual practices. To haters, Non-Zoos who would stand and say, leave these people alone and let them be happy, may as well have their own dicks and a sheep or a pussy filled with dog semen. <laughs> Indeed, there is an unjust moral and ethical wall the LGBT people are still struggling to break through to get people to see, understand, and accept that their sexualities are normal and that they are just people trying to survive and be happy like everyone else. Mm. For zoos, that same wall is covered in spikes, topped with razor wire, coated in acidic slime, and surrounded by a mode of toxic waste full of radioactive pranas. <laughs> Kisses for bitches, says in his final comments, but I'm not saying we should ever give up. <laughs> Hugs, kisses, and with great respect. So, there's our um, letter. Toggle, what do you think? So, the first thing that, you know, my first impression of this is it seems like this guy probably lives in, like, a rural area or somewhere where uh, there's still a lot of like intolerance or maybe 
uh, a lot of social pressure to conform to societal norms. Where so, so not like a, you know, I, in the city of Pittsburgh, you know, being gay is pretty fucking normal. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, pushback against that uh, uh, that you really experience. Um, this is but, this is a big deep email up long mm -hmm. and w we feel it's more than worth the investment of time and attention in it because it is bringing to the surface as toggle had just said a few minutes ago um, uh, concerns and issues that are real they are real right. in terms of the lgbt community they are real in terms of you know, risks and and challenges for zoos in society today mm -hmm. and it, it is a healthy and important and constructive for us to honor the reality of these, in a sense, unspoken fears that more or less right. every zoo has. And in right. leaving them unspoken, we think that we actually give them uh, more credence than they deserve. So we are grateful to have the opportunity to read through this this well-reasoned, uh, well-spoken, mm -hmm. passionate, and, and uh, deeply honest um, summary of a fear that many right. or most of us or all of us really have in the community. So for, right off the yeah. bat, we're grateful for it. And then mm -hmm. we drop into the analysis. And as, as Toggle had started the analysis uh, w within the... Like, there's like, there's all kinds of like, oh yeah, that's absolutely true, absolutely. but... Yeah, right. But I, 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 I think, there's always a but yeah, for yeah, me. Right, exactly. Well, Toggle, there's always a but for you. We know how you oh are. Oh my God. With, well, I had to say, because somebody uh, had to do well. it, right? Well, <laughs> it, it, that is actually a, a neat framing of our reaction, I think, as, as, a, as a team, Toggle and I, to this email is, yes, but... Or yes, and mm -hmm. you can say yes. We agree with like an improv class, right? M much of what he's saying, yeah, and we're and then and and then we build on it. So I think we right. are not looking at this email as as and really in, in any meaningful sense something that we are um, disagreeing with or, or challenging. Right. We are building mm -hmm. on that, and that really ties directly into the legal analysis that, that, we're, that we're participating in later on in this episode, and it's why mm -hmm. this is a great opportunity to take this big, hairy, challenging, scary question slash topic off the, you know, off the shelf and put it on, you know, right on the table, front and center. Okay, here we are. It's mm -hmm. scary to think about being a zoo in today's society. It's scary to think about the challenge of finding a way from where we are as as a community, as as zoos right now, mm -hmm. in that we are subject to not only you know persecution in terms of day to day life and and uh, and and vigilante weirdness, but legalized mm -hmm. persecution. We, we were subject to legal uh, attack in many um, the majority of jurisdictions where listeners are are, are tuning into zooier than thou. So, you know, this reality that we have today is scary. And uh, right. I think the best way for us to um, initiate our discussion and to engage with that fear is to acknowledge its reality and then to pick it apart and see which parts of it really hold um, a, a depth of truth to them under closer examination and which parts are maybe a little more fear and a little less based in things that we would say that we can validate when we look around, you know, in, in the world around yeah. us, right? So I think one thing, there's a lot of comparison to the LGBT community. Yes. And, I, you know, I feel like in the spaces where I, you know, tend to be, uh, the progress is very noticeable. But, you know, just like he says, there are places in, you know, Africa where you can still be killed for being gay. And, well, that's also, by the way, uh, being funded by uh, mm -hmm. Chick-fil-A, so yes. don't eat there don't for the love them. of fucking God. Yeah, they are not a supporter um, of good things in the world in general, and we are better no, served supporting uh, businesses and, and groups that are supportive of positive outcomes, and Chick-fil-A doesn't seem to be anywhere near that category. Mm -mm, in very many ways. Uh, but anyway, you, so you've got that dynamic where, yes, there are places where being gay is still persecuted with up to death. But However, this idea that and. that there's this... <laughs> mm -hmm. There's this idea that in this in the email, like the, the, like there's something that's impossible to get to. Right. Uh, like we can never get to a point. And one thing that we discussed, you and I, Fausti, is like how it was for you in the 80s as a gay person. 
as ancient and, and crusty and gray-muzzled as it makes me seem to say this, which actually also it makes me seem that way because I am. So there, there, that's the other side of that. It's not just saying this that makes me seem that way. It's because I am. Uh, I was I was in high school in the 1980s and brief started college in 1989. And I well remember conversations amongst um, not only uh, friends and colleagues, uh, teachers in high school, uh, professors in college, uh, but uh, family members, um, you know, my closest nuclear family, during which we would talk about, because we have in my extended family, um, a number of folks who are openly gay and have been, you know, since the 1970s. So it is a topic in our family that isn't, um, you know, those other people, it's it's us, right? And so right. that the, the closest uh, members of my family would often comment that, look, we all know that Uncle So and So, who is gay and who has a boyfriend, a live-in boyfriend, and you know has had a live-in boyfriend, you know, for more than a decade mm-hmm. at the time, he's a great guy, and there's nothing wrong with him, and and really at core, there's nothing wrong with being gay. Look, we all know that, we all get that. However, society has judged that that sexuality is wrong, and that's just the way things are, and we have to acknowledge that whether we agree or disagree with that, and in fact, we disagree with that, society says being gay is wrong, and really, functionally speaking, no matter whether we're activists or not activists, and our family is composed of activists, really at core, nothing's going to change that. And Mm -hmm. it was just taken as a given that that was an unchangeable reality, an unfortunate reality, but a reality that simply was passed down to us and would exist forever. That was a reasonable assumption to make as late as let's say 1985 that was consensus uh, assumption that Mm -hmm. being gay probably wasn't actually evil that you know the whole weirdness about gay people just secretly chasing children around and turning them gay in ceremonies (laughs) in the dark of night or whatever that was all silly like by the mid 1980s everybody kind of knew that was silly and that was all just kind of surface uh, um, a, a decoration at the same time very few people uh, I think outside a, a, a central core of activists would have argued with a straight face in 1985 in, in, a, in a day-to-day conversation that in a very short period of time, being gay would not only no longer be seen as evil, but would be celebrated actively as a part of a healthy, diverse uh, community that the prime ministers in Canada would march in gay pride parades with pride and enthusiasm and excitement that the concept of of being gay, uh, as, as being subject to legal persecution yeah. would be inconceivable, and, and that gay marriage, in fact, would be embraced as an obviously accurate, reasonable, healthy, good thing. That To say right. that in 1985, that that would happen in anybody's lifetime, man, that would have been an impossible, unrealistic... Um, you, you know, a pie in the sky thing to say. Yeah. And I grew up in that world where it was just accepted that being gay wasn't evil, but the society would always treat it as horror. Right. And now, not too many years later, in my you know relatively short lifespan here, that is 180 degrees around. And indeed, when I talk to younger folks and say, you know, when I was young, people hated gay people and and you were allowed to do that. That was acceptable. They're like, yeah, whatever, old man, you know, that wasn't really the way things were. No, really it was like (laughs) it switched so much around that now it seems inconceivable that it, that it really was that way. That seems like something out of history books, not something that, that we lived in. And so I I think in, in saying that toggle and I are reminding ourselves and as community members reminding our, you know, ourselves broadly as a community, that which may seem inconceivable at any point in time, isn't necessarily inconceivable in historical time and it is very mm-hmm. difficult to predict what will or will not change with, right with you know with strong accuracy to the degree that you would really bet your life on it right yeah think about where zoo is now and you know i i, I learned about honey maletsky uh interviewing humane society back in the 90s mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. in the 90s humane society she she interviewed and was like hey so you guys Notice you don't have any material on sex with animals? Is there a reason for that? And they were like, well, yeah, why would we have material on sex with animals? It doesn't harm the animal. That was the consensus of the Humane Society in the 90s. Yeah, that this was a non-issue. That there, this was not a question of, of protecting or not protecting non-humans. That questions of whether cross-species sexuality was okay or not were questions of human sexuality. Right. And 
to to build on that in the 1980s when I was a young zoo before the internet, which yes, was a thing. There was a before the internet and I grew <laughs> up in that before the internet. I had no way as a zoo and we've talked about this in prior episodes of the podcast. I felt really in my early teen years as a zoo who had chosen to um, abandon my virginity. I didn't lose it. I absolutely left it by the side of the road with a big smile on my face. There was no losing involved. There was a <laughs> dumping. I dumped my virginity on the side of the road with an absolutely gorgeous, wonderful, handsome golden retriever. And we shared many, many hours together. And having um, come out of a, a, a a prepubescent world into a, a young adult sexuality as a zoo, I really felt that it was most likely that I was the only human being in the world who had this particular attraction and that it was unique. That was it. I was, that was it. I was the first one and there was nobody else out there and that, you know, I, I was the only one. Now, as I um, came into high school and, and uh, poked around and kept my ears open, uh, there was no internet. I couldn't go search the internet. I was always looking for any potential reference to cross species stuff, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm um, curious, you know, also young and male and, and keeping my eyes open. And, you know, right. all of my, uh, no, you know, non-zoo friends are reading Play, Playboy and, you know, <laughs> uh, looking at Hustler magazines. And I'm thinking, you know, eh, boy, that must be nice. I don't get anything like that. I mean, I, I, then again, I was having enormous amounts of wonderful sex with wonderful partners. So I couldn't <laughs> really feel too sorry for myself. But even so, <laughs> and... and Eventually, I started stumbling on references, and the point of those references were that here and there, let's say in like the penthouse letters, there were these weird little um, penthouse letters uh, story collections that would get mailed out every few months to subscribers. Mm -hmm. right. There would be explicitly zooey stories. Yep. A woman with, you know, large breasts and flowing, you know, blonde hair or whatever the, you know, cliches were, had a torrid affair with a Doberman retriever stud dog who was well endowed and fucked for hours or whatever the, you know, silly yeah. penthouse versions I've of these that were. Shit. Yep. Yeah, but there was nothing about this that was seen as extraordinarily unusual, weird, um, um, it was erotic. It was erotic. It was part of the same erotica that you would read with threesomes, orgies, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, this in in the mid 1980s, it wasn't that that Jewish sexuality was like accepted and embraced as part of everyday conversations, or you would see it on TV. And yet, if you came two levels underneath that kind of everyday thing, you'd find references to Jewish stuff all over the place in erotica, in erotic mm -hmm. literature, mm -hmm. in, in conversations, in jokes. Th there was nothing about this that saw Jewish interactions as crazily weird, aberrant, scary, oh my God, Abusive. unacceptable. And zero, the whole mm -hmm. concept of that being abusive, abusive to the stud dog, who was having sex with the gorgeous blonde woman? What? Right. Like, that's the silliest thing in the world. No, there's not. It's, I mean, maybe, no, there, there was no uh, the framing of it. it. There was nothing like that. So that stuff came in the last 20 years. Yeah, right. Exactly. But, but you know, in, let's, let's take a, a date of 1990. Zua stuff pre-internet was around. Uh, it was talked about. It was included in relatively mainstream adult magazines and erotica and so on and so forth. And it was not subject of a particular ob obsession with re rejecting it societally. Right. Now, in the last 20-ish years since then, we have this crazy weird veer into an obsessive in insistence mm -hmm. that cross-species intimacy is some is, is, is animal cross-species rape, abuse, terrible, right. horrific... The those poor fur babies, they don't know what sex is, and poor, humans are are forcing them into, into horrible sexual blah, 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 blah. And those of us who are zoos are listening to this rambling, incoherent nonsense and like, what? What the hell are you talking about? Like, none of you thought that 20 years ago, so where did this right. all come from? Right. And it, these changes happen in, in, in very short periods of time. That which changes in that direction, I think Toggle might be arguing here while I talk over top of him over and over again, yeah. is that it can change just as quickly in the other direction. And exactly. It is. Exactly. And right now, see, when you think about this, it's a very short amount of time. But for some of the zoos that are listening to this, it's their entire lifetime. That is, True. this has been the paradigm. And right. so it's really hard to fathom that even before that, that there was something where zoo was not really that big of a fucking deal. I mean, right. again, you don't have the widespread acceptance, but it's not illegal right. in the U.S. at right. least. Right. Uh, right. It had been you explicitly know, decriminalized. Yes. Yeah, correct. it explicitly decriminalized. Uh, the Humane Society was like, this is okay. 
you know, the, the to- founder of the modern animal rights movement, mm-hmm. Peter Singer, mm-hmm. in Animal Liberation and in his other writings, a position that he has stuck with consistently all throughout, has looked at the question of is 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 sexual intimacy between humans and non-humans automatically harmful or somehow wrong from the perspective of the non-human? Peter Singer's answer to that, and I am I, I am compressing it only only a little bit from his answer is uh, no. Next question. Like, no, that's silly. No, obviously it's not automatically wrong for other species than humans to have sex. Everybody has sex. It's healthy. So if humans and non-humans have sex sometimes, it can be healthy or unhealthy, just like all sex. It's just sex. Next question. Like, he's worried about factory farms and stuff. He's not worried about who's touching whose pee-pee. Like, that's just absurd. So Exactly. So this paradigm is not permanent. There's no no. reason to even believe it's permanent, except that we're so... It's rickety. uh, Yeah. You you know, I, I talked about this a little bit on um, Twitter um, I found a video I was watching a video on the alt-right playbook which is about mm-hmm. uh, how they normalize or how they radicalize normal people mm-hmm. and one of the major repetition. things was repetition. repetition it's repetition, repetition because repetition. a good argument does not have to be repeated over and over again you internalize it you can repeat it to someone else but a bad argument needs to be repeated over and over again or else at some point if you lose the mantra, you're going to realize that it's full of shit. The mantra is animals can't consent. Animals can't consent. Repeated animals over can't consent and over, over and over, and over, and over again. again. Literally, like, someone if on my you say Twitter it enough times it magically becomes true. Right. Someone Which, on my Twitter account was like, just every time someone would respond to something, <laughs> that's all they would say. You, I remember this seeing is, that. It's like yeah. what? And some the tweets were some, like just it was a tweet with like twenty times repeated line after line after line. Animals can't consent. Animals can't consent. Like that's it's wow, a mantra. It's a mantra yeah. because you have to keep repeating that mantra or else because it's silly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah or else it, you'll be exposed to the bullshit. Basically, the, the 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 real point of all of that is that the idea that animals can't consent is modern. It didn't exist before. It's in 20 years, it won't exist recently. anymore. Yeah, well said. Um, yes. So we don't have to worry about the permanence of this. And the other thing that he he mentions is allies not being willing to actually stand up for us. And, you know, again, there's, there's a truth to that because we know a lot of indifferent. Most people are indifferent. We know when Kareen Maloney was interviewing people, they would go on records being against... Uh, zoophilia, right. but then right. off the record, be like, I don't actually give a shit. It doesn't matter to me. It does, it's, there's no reason why this is wrong. I just have to say it because I don't want to get labeled right. that way. I have and been that is in, a truth. In my decades as a zoo who lives out in everyday life, I have had more conversations than I can count with non zoos who, knowing my sexuality because I'm out, will quietly sit down with me over a beer, a cup of coffee, in the barn, in the kennel, on a hike, and say, hey, so, you, animals, sex, right? I'm like, okay, yeah, hi, that's me. Um, Look, I know that what you guys do is unusual and maybe a little different, and maybe I don't understand all the details, but I also know that if you and Amara get together and the two of you decide that you want to do something and you have a great time together, who am I to say that there's something wrong with that? That's absurd. You two do what you two need to do and keep it maybe amongst yourselves, and I don't necessarily want to you know, know the details, but I also know that it's silly to claim that somebody's raping somebody in that context. However, mm-hmm. and they'll often say to me, however, I obviously can't say that in public because I just right. can't. Now, this includes people up to Olympic level equestrian competitors, top level show dog competitors, top level uh, field trial competitors, uh, people from all walks of life, lawyers, doctors, judges, prosecutors, policemen, you name it. Now, all of these people have told me these things and said, that's between you and I, and I will never break those, those confidences with them. And yet, dozens and dozens and dozens of times I've had people who on the surface say publicly, oh, I think this zoo stuff is just terrible, horrible. And then they'll come, you know, behind the scenes and say, hey, look, I just want you to know, I don't actually feel like that. that, that well, obviously, that's ridiculous. I just right. have to say that because that's where we're at, you know, societally. That is real. Right. That does so happen. That's real. But, but. Uh, you know, uh, a couple of things. I have a friend who started as an anti-zoo, had the questioning happen, and now is indifferent, more or less. Um, I would say favoring... Uh, like he's you know favoring pro zoo but indifferent more or less and he has spoken out on his twitter about it to the and has lamented to me the kind of backlash he gets but 
willing to actually say something in public. And I think back to the 80s again, when it was very unpopular to speak out and say, you know, gay people are right. I think Bernie Sanders was out there uh, in Vermont or yes. wherever. Absolutely. and. Actively gay pride, supporting gay folks. Actively gay, supporting so. gay people. And I think, you know, even us, Peter Singer's not a zoophile. Right. But he actively will right. speak up and He's say... He's taken enormous pressure because he has, he has chosen to honor the truth of the circumstances rather than honoring the societal falsity. Exactly. That, so there are people that are, that have that integrity. Um... And, you know, to some extent, I, I can't fault people necessarily, but... No, of course not. And and there's a dynamic that happens here that is not linear. Let's think back, Toggle. You and I, I think, are both familiar with this example. To mm-hmm. the um, the red scares of mm. the 1960s and the early 1970s, the, the communist scares. Mm-hmm. And, and in American um, uh, government... Joseph McCarthy, Senator Joseph McCarthy, went mm-hmm. on these uh, witch hunts, and these were mm-hmm. legit, actual witch hunts, not the mm-hmm. fake Trump version of witch hunts. Yeah. And they would run around and claim to be finding these closet communists here, there, and everywhere. It was Hollywood. very, very mm-hmm. dangerous mm-hmm. to stand up against McCarthy because he had the weight he of society behind him. He, he would destroy you. He would blackball you. He destroy many careers, many families, um, many very promising artistic, you know, um, you name it, countless individuals were targeted right. by McCarthy if they so much as hesitated to denounce, you know, whoever McCarthy claimed was a closet communist, McCarthy mm-hmm. would smash them just as badly as a closet communist or his alleged closet communist. Now, this seemed like it would never change. It was a unanimous, overwhelmingly powerful cultural reality. And yet, eventually, without getting into too much of the boring historical details, at a hearing, televised, a witness finally mm-hmm. looked McCarthy in the eyes and said, "Have you no shame? Are you? Don't you ever get tired of lying about this shit? I, like we've had enough." And it it was it was a non-linear phase transition where one person saying that at the right time opened the door that everybody else was already thinking that, and once one person said it. Then McCarthy was done. It was over. So yeah, he, his, the, the, he the, was destroyed just the same way he, he was destroyed, destroyed everyone else. Appropriately enough. Now the the fake the fake obsession about a, a Jewish intimacy being uh, horrific, uh, rape at a massive global scale, abuse, uh, consent, uh, animals, fur babies have to have their genitals chopped off to protect them from sex. Blah 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 blah. This is as stupid or more stupid than the imaginary communist hunts that McCarthy did. Everybody knows it. There is a tipping point coming where the the morons who repeat these stupid arguments will find that the 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 ground on which they felt they could continue to broadcast their prejudice and their their false their hatreds based on utter silly falsities will fall away from underneath their feet and when that happens it happens in a rush it doesn't happen over the period of decades mm-hmm. and and I believe as an activist and I think many others in the community have an have a sense a hunch a feeling this mm-hmm. phase transition Maybe it's not going to happen tomorrow. I won't predict what day it's going to happen. I know that in my lifetime it will happen because I've watched it already start. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. we would make a mistake as individuals and as a community to take today's um, view of the terrain where everybody mouths, everybody in quotes, you know, mouths these these silly absurdities about non-human adults that they can't have sex because somehow... Only humans are, are the, the species on the planet who engage in physical intimacy without raping each other in the process. This is the <laughs> dumbest fucking thing you can possibly imagine saying. And and yet, to a, to a degree, everybody runs around pretending like they agree with that. That will fall at, at an accelerated mm-hmm. rate when some catalyst hits it. And I have no idea what it is. It won't be me or it won't be anything mm-hmm. intentional, most likely. It'll be just some somebody will take the whole thing too far and it will mm-hmm. become absurd and, and it will become a point... Of, of derision and and, mm-hmm. and a risible joke that people mm-hmm. once believed that animals can't have sex in the same way that Joseph McCarthy wanted everybody to believe that there were secret communists hiding everywhere in America, which was just not the case. So mm-hmm. uh, though we acknowledge the fear that uh, Kisses for Bitches brings up and the fact that it does seem oppressingly unanimous today 
that this this uh, at least publicly stated hatred of those of us um, who love outside our species like this mm-hmm. is this is an eternal status quo that can't ever shift. No, that is not the way that a review of societal history and cultural transitions. Mm-hmm. That is not what we learn when we look back. What we learn is that these things seem like they'll last forever until they don't. And we as a community need to embrace that reality because that's the future that we're working toward. Um, one other thing that you expressed concern about is the inability to be out. Uh, mm-hmm. To to say you in a loud voice, I'm a zoo, I'm here, and deal with me. And I'm proud of who I am. And I'm proud of who I am. So I understand uh, there is a reality where that is dangerous. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... It's the same reality where it was dangerous for gay people to be openly gay in the 70s. Dangerous. Actively dangerous. Harmful to their so. health. Matthew they could be Shepherd. killed. Matthew yep. Shepard yep. died in the 90s. It's right. as close as the 90s where you could be killed mm-hmm. for being gay. And trans people right now are going through a are point where it can be dangerous. Yes, um, very much. In North America. But the catalyst for the gay movement, I would say, is... In Stonewall, in a sense, Right. Right. Well, you yeah, Stonewall definitely. Stonewall kicked everything off because something just something snapped. It was the riot, right. basically. Right, right. But then there was an emphasis on coming out because by being seen and being visible, other people know we that you we exist. Can't be erased. We can't be erased. Right. We're real. Right. Yeah, you're real. You're not a caricature of what you what people tell say you are. You're someone's m- brother, son, uh, you know, daughter. Uh, mother even you know you are a person that people know and you lend humanity to the term zoophile and at the same time I can't I can't in good conscience fault someone like kisses for bitches for for staying in the closet uh, because there is a danger and maybe it's not appropriate for you or the people that you love to be able to do that because there's a there's a risk of harm to your loved ones. You will know, you will know as individuals and we know as individuals when the time is right and when it's not. And I think mm-hmm. we need to honor that knowledge of our unique personal circumstances and the the decisions that we make about our safety and our identity and our public stance on these issues mm-hmm. can only be made by us and in we must honor the integrity of that process. And none of us, I think, who are out, such as myself, Mm -hmm. in any way feel that those who have good reasons, by definition, good reasons, that they choose to follow a different path at this point in time, there is nothing about that where we're looking down on that or thinking that it's somehow inferior to the path that we're on. It Mm -hmm. takes all kinds, and it takes a community of diversity for Mm -hmm. us to be strong and for us to move forward. Mm -hmm. And if and when the time is right for, for example, for Kisses for Bitches to step forward out of the the private uh, space into a public space, if that time comes for him or her, I think we, I don't think we know gender here, so we don't want to be gendered here. um, Mm -hmm. He or she will know when that time is right. And if that time is not yet right, then that time is not yet right. And that is part of being a healthy community that we recognize that. When we see transformative events like Stonewall happen, this did not happen because activists were hectoring each other and demanding that gay folks, um, you know, come out as a group. It happened Mm -hmm. because there was a critical frustration level that built up to a breaking point where enough people just said, oh, fucking to hell with it. I'm done with this shit, okay? Whatever, I'm gay, I have a boyfriend, I have a girlfriend, get over it, I'm done, you know? And and when that happens at a certain critical mass, it becomes all mm-hmm. but impossible to target those individuals because there's too many. They're just right. the people around you. That is the dynamic that happens and that dynamic will happen when the time is right. It can't be mm-hmm. forced. It can't be forced. And so we can't tell you, you better come out or else. But I have to emphasize, as I have from episode one, exposure is the solution. Being seen is what will help us gain the traction that we need. And that can be slow. um, And that's okay. Some of the most fascinating experiences for me as as a zoo who has lived out for more than a decade, um, full out. I've been out in federal prison. I've been out. You know, in in school, in academic context, in business, in fundraising rounds, uh, in in interviews, it, like I'm out. I'm like really out and well known as an out zoo. 
um, mm -hmm. a, uh, a notorious <laughs> zoo <laughs> at a global level, as uh, Maloney had, had uh, once referred to me as. Not in not necessarily incorrectly. I live in a neighborhood with other folks around me, most of whom I'm assuming are not zoos. And <laughs> early on, as I as I come to you know a place like this where I live now, um, I know as I walk down the street or um, you know drive down the down the road in my truck. There are a lot of people looking out the window. There's that guy. It's that guy. Holy shit. That's that dog. That's that zoo guy. Whoa. Like, you know what? <laughs> that's the first day or the second day or the third. After a month or two or three, it's like, oh, there's Doug. Yeah, he's he's wearing those terrible shorts again, and he's out picking up his mail. And <laughs> oh I really my wish God, he would mow so his lawn because he hasn't mowed his lawn for a while. I can't fucking believe you called yourself just, out, but fuck, your it, shorts are just, terrible. <laughs> they are terrible. I have terrible fashion sense. Being a zoo doesn't give me magical fashion sense. Like, I have good days and bad days and I'm a person <laughs> like anybody else and oh instead of God. me being a zoo I'm that guy who wears those awful shorts right <laughs> we we humanize ourselves by being as we human. are for, you know during the day right being human now I do hope that I'm also able to put my best foot forward as a zoo so that folks see me and say oh he's that guy that zoo guy whatever but you know what he actually came over you know last weekend when uh, you know when my my husband was sick and um, and I and wasn't able to cook dinner or whatever. I'm, I'm extemporizing here and uh, dropped off, you know, some fresh basil, you know, for me and, and sent, you know, best wishes that my husband would get well. That's a nice thing to do. Yeah, that zoo guy's nice. Like that matters because mm -hmm. in, in balance to my bad, you know, taste and fashion, hopefully <laughs> I make up for that by being a good person in other regards. And if I would point to the transformative events I've seen in my own life as an out zoo, those are the opportunities when I'm able to just be a good person. Well, not just be a good person, to be a good person. There's no mm -hmm. just about it. To be a good right. person. Right. And it is very hard to hold a stereotype of monstrous, evil, animal raping, zoosexuals. Uh, uh, then there's that guy Doug down the street who goes, you know, for a walk with his elderly mother who has dementia and and who is, you know, very very close to um, the end of her life. And each evening, when the weather is good, we go out for a walk and we walk up and down the road together and we enjoy you know, the evening together. And I'm gonna cry when I talk about, about this. It's okay. But that's who I am. Uh, that's who I am. I'm the person who is with his mother, taking a walk and enjoying the sunset. And I guess I'm also a zoo, and there is nothing shameful or inappropriate with that. Um, at that particular moment, I'm I'm a son, and and I'm somebody who loves his mother and who is sharing the time that I have left with her in the way that I can, and being the best son and the best person I can, as I think all of us choose to be, zoo or not zoo. And those are the transformative moments when we have the opportunity to take a stereotype and and wash it away with the reality of of the fully lived experience of what it is to to be a good human being. And that is where I think the transformation happens over time. It is a small individual transformation, one tiny step at a time, and it is through those small tiny steps that mountains are moved. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. One other thing that I, I feel is absolutely essential to bring up in the context of this activism, activism in support of the zoo community is not easy. Anybody who would think it is would uh, be quickly disabused of that. I actually don't know anybody who thinks it is. No. So we, we, we think it's hard. You know what? It is. I've been doing this for decades. It's hard. Right. And um, I have to say that um, when things are going well, when things are going poorly, the reason at core that this matters to me more than any other activism I could be undertaking is not primarily because I'm a zoo and therefore I want society to treat me fairly. That That's not what drives me. It right. would be nice, yeah. but whatever. Life's often not fair. What drives me is that as zoos, we are the vanguard mm -hmm. who maintain a connection mm -hmm. with other other people outside our species yes. and with the larger living world. Mm -hmm. And the fact that our society sees us as a lightning rod for hatred because of our connection to the living world outside of humanity is not a random coincidence. It is, it is in indicative. Fact, true. It is indicative. Mm -hmm. It is the very reason that we are targeted for hatred because we see other living beings with respect and with um, with a genuine love and a compassion and a caring and an acceptance of them as other people, just as important and fascinating 
and and uh, for whom the right to have lives of meaning and of purpose and of health and of safety on this planet are just as important as mm-hmm. are the rights of humans to have those opportunities. Yes. We are those people by our very nature as zoos, and we are hated by a society that has gone down a dead end of ecocidal, destructive, mm-hmm. dysfunctional, unhealthy, mm-hmm. horrific behavior that unless we as a species choose a path forward that is different from that path we've been on in recent decades, we yes. will destroy the planet and everybody who lives on it, including Fuck, ourselves. Yeah, we will. That, those are the stakes. Those mm-hmm. are the stakes of the game. Mm-hmm. Now, is it worth working towards a different path? Yeah. Because the stakes are life on the planet. Okay. <laughs> right. That's a pretty big deal, right? I mean, right. so a, as a zoo, I work on this particular flavor of activism because it is my way to pull in the direction of a healthy future, a healthy planet where mm-hmm. we respect each other and where we understand that we live together in connectivity, not as individual human species and everybody else uh, are there only for us to use and and uh, toss away when no longer economically viable. Disposable. Yeah, that is not the future that I choose. Yeah, animals or, or ecosystems, not just animals, species. And we as zoos, we are not part of that Mm-mm. narrative. We 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 live a different future, and we must be the activists who work towards that different future. And that's why what we do matters. Now, Fausti, I hear in my little ear someone saying, mm, "I'm a little skeptical of that." And I just want to say, if you are skeptical of the idea that zoos uh, are Mm. dangerous to the paradigm of Ex- exploitative abuse of the mm-hmm. life on this planet. Yes, if you if you think that that's not true, then take a look at who's sponsoring anti-bestiality bills and you're going to find that uh, the factory farming industries yes. are part of that conversation because we're a danger to them. We are a rejection by our very identity of the fatuous claim that human beings have a right to abuse the planet at will without any regard for consequences or moral standing. Mm -hmm. And in zoos, by our family nature and by the deepest intimacy that we have in our lives as as mammals, reject that, uh, Mm -hmm. not by words, but by action. And we are targeted by the industries and the individuals who profit from ecocidal abuse of our planet. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, we should be proud to be targeted by them because they are the monsters that we must find a way to write out of the future of the narrative of life on our planet or there will be no life on our planet. It is our obligation to stand against them and it is our honor to be targeted by them as enemies because we are indeed enemies of the model that they carry forward and that they attempt to force on the future of life on mm. our planet. Fuck them. Well, w- with kindness, right? We, <laughs> we must find a way to move past those broken narratives without um, un- un- uh, um, engaging in an unhealthy hatred of the individuals that carry the narratives mm. themselves. It, it, right, it is right, imperative right, right. that we not be consumed by the hatred that is targeted at us and that we transcend that hatred to see a better future for everybody on the planet, even those people mm. who were at some point in time uh, promulgating the very hatred that we have stood against. Mm. Well said. Thank you so much for your email. I think that it was super important for you to really voice those concerns, and it was a very vulnerable thing to be yes. able to do. It's very uh, courageous. Very much. We really appreciate that, and I hope that... Uh, our discussion of your email kind of helps fill in the gaps of those fears. We also hope, I think, that our discussion will engender and encourage and nurture more uh, mm-hmm. further discussions and f- mm-hmm. uh, further conversations amongst zoos and amongst zoos and non-zoos um, in, in individual communities, in families, um, in businesses, in friendships. And that we continue to talk about these challenging, uh, difficult, uh, frightening questions in service of uh, uh, continuing to refine our vision for the future. And Mm -hmm. Toggle and I taking the time to discuss this on the podcast. Above all else, we hope that it will encourage others to engage in these discussions with those most close to them 
And through that type of uh, discussion at scale, I think that we as a community become the best community and force for good that we can mm -hmm. be. Thank you so much, X's and O's, kisses for bitches. We Very will be so. right back after this message from our sponsors to get into the meat of the Legal Beagle episode. This week's podcast is brought to you by Burns Hay Based Turkeys for Horses. For the zoo who wants to bring their equine partner to the Thanksgiving table. Also by Mr. Ed's Equine Language and Grammar Lessons, now available on VHS. And finally, by lawyers. Don't worry about the fine print, we just need you to sign here, here, initial here, uh, here. <laughs> Alright, bring us back from sponsors. Me. You, yeah. I never, I don't, I'm not the one that brings us back from spawn. I've never, <laughs> Toggle, you've never trusted me to okay. do that, and now we know why, right? So. <clears throat> Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are going to get started with our legal Beagles episode. See, that was great. I could never, that is not my capability there. So thank you, thank you, Toggle, for doing that. Yes, we are my back pleasure. from sponsors. Yes. <clears throat> Without further ado, let us get going on the question of legal backgrounds in the context of how they affect our community. I have thought probably way too much about how I wanted to approach this and um, taken too many notes that are mostly not useful. So Toggle and I have agreed that I will start talking and he will interject when there are useful interjections to make, which I hope will be quickly. And with that- Interjections, sure excitement and emotion. We, we should have- set apart from sentence oh, by an exclamation point or a back comment when the feeling's See, not as strong. There, it already got better because of that, just right <laughs> off the bat. <clears throat> Stepping as far back as I think our frame can go, when we talk about legal systems, the law mm -hmm. or more broadly legal systems, what are we talking about? Let's think about what legal systems are as a species. Mm -hmm. As a human species, we have had formalized legal systems for, and I am not an academic specialist in this area, I accuse, <laughs> uh, excuse me for inaccuracies here, approximately 8,000 years, give or wow. take. Yeah, it, I believe traces back, and if I was a good podcast host, I would have researched this more carefully to make sure this was exactly correct. W within an order of magnitude, about 8,000 years, Sumerian legal systems were going from memory in my own legal classes. The first uh, to codify in, in any kind of formal writing a, a, a method for handling legal disputes. Now, mm -hmm. that's not to say that humanity hasn't had legal systems further back than that. Right. As, as a species that's about 300,000 years old, Homo sapiens sapiens, we have always had a sense of how we interact with one another as social beings. That Part of having a society is having a yes. social contract, and yes. you have to have ways of reinforcing that social contract when the norms are broken. And indeed, th those requirements and those systems and mechanisms are not dependent on language, which is to say yeah. that our fellow mammalian uh, brethren who do not have formalized um, um, gr grammatical uh, linguistic structures, <clears throat> which mm -hmm. excludes, uh, by the way, some of the marine mammals who do have those structures, we just don't understand them yet. Um, it is mm -hmm. possible to have s social um, mores, requirements, standards, expectations, baseline standards, mm -hmm. uh, guidelines, rules, whatever words we want to stick on these concepts. Right. Uh, any, any social critter, um, mammals and non-mammals alike, have them. For human beings mm -hmm. as a species, uh, for the 300,000 years we have been a species, we've always had those because we've been a social species all the way through. Um, when we started developing spoken language, which we think was about 70,000 years ago, question mark, we don't really know. Um, we assume that these um, standards of social interaction started to become um, in, um, codified in in, uh, in in written or rather in spoken form in in, in language form as mm -hmm. rules or as stories or as narratives or as explanations to each other about what is right and what is wrong. Those mm -hmm. baseline expectations come from our mammalian background. Indeed, a lot of what we think of as intrinsically right and wrong in the context of even the most modern legal system, written down, codified, passed into statutory law, is in a sense an extension of the fundamental 
basics of mammalian social integration that we find in all sorts of other social mammal species. We're not far removed, and there's nothing uniquely human about being social and having roles for how we work with one another. That's true. Uh, One thing we mentioned on a podcast before is that other animal groups do have culture. Yes. And part of culture is a system of codes and mores that are followed. uh, And you can think of law as a codified version of those social mores. A subset, I'll call it to a degree. It's a subset. There are certainly other things that aren't put into law. Yes. um, Like, you know, washing your hands after you... Right. You take a piss in um, most exactly. legal systems, but not all. <laughs> most actually. legal systems. <laughs> there, there, if, if if we look at Sharia law, that would actually be enshrined as as a formal legal requirement. So they're, mm. you know, they're, yeah, it's the it, it, the, the but, boundaries you know. of what is and isn't um, appropriate or included in a narrative <clears throat> about a legal system are fluid and interesting in and of themselves. Which is to mm-hmm. say, when we look at what we we think of as legal questions whether that's in spoken uh, a language or after we start writing things down in written language in Sumerian legal systems and f- from that point forward, we're talking mm-hmm. about a very small subset for the most part of of human social interactions with each other and to a degree right. with the rest of the world. And that's really where we start to get to the meat of the matter here. Now, as, as, a, as a, a theorist and as a an appreciator of the history of law, I find it fascinating and also very important to note that the Sumerian written legal systems come into existence and and then expand and in a sense um, give rise to all of the legal systems that we live within today as as a species and as other Mm. species stuck inside our legal systems have to yeah, do true. with managing social interactions relating to agriculture. That that itself is not an accident. Mm. It is mm-hmm. only when we started engaging in organized agriculture as a species <laughs> that we began to have concepts of property and ownership mm-hmm. and the control and distribution of the right to ownership of property that more closely reflect what we think of as standard issues in, in, our, in our narrative today. Although mm. those concepts exist outside of agricultural human societies, they tend to be qualitatively different. And I'm making huge right. generalizations here, but but bear with right. me so this doesn't turn into a six-hour long, boring discussion. Um, the written legal systems only come once we have farming. And humanity's um, experiment with, with organized agriculture... Uh, many theorists would say has been a catastrophic disaster. We used to think that that brought us um, longer uh, lifespans, uh, uh, a a surplus of food that we could count on. Uh, Research has since shown that that is not the case. In fact, um, a a modern or organized agricultural systems have resulted in much more famine, um, a a poorer access to nutrition, and lowered lifespans for the human beings who live within those systems. So, Wow. Yes. That, That's crazy. A very different narrative comes out of the, the quantitative historical evidence than mm-hmm. comes out of what we tell ourselves as a story of why we're, we're farmers and not hunter-gatherers. Right. Because for mm-hmm. the most of our experience as human beings, we've been hunter-gatherers and only developed farming about 8,000 years ago. The fact that legal systems wow. as we think of them today and uh, that are written and codified into formalisms are... Um, to be found only in concurrent um, development with the expansion of organized centralized farming, N- not an accident. That's that's a thing. That's real, mm-hmm. and it is because once we develop farming, and we think of ourselves as a, a species that controls the procreation and production of of living wealth that we then use to support ourselves, um, mm-hmm. we end up with questions of ownership and control of property that were mm-hmm. different that are different than what we had before if if you have a bunch of grain that you have harvested at the end of a of a good year you need to store that grain over the winter and distribute it amongst your society somehow not right. just the farmers right. who picked it get access to it because that's that's a social asset in a sense likewise right. if but the grain goes the bad person- but mm-hmm. yeah go ahead with your butt because there I was is gonna a say, but as the person who produces that, you expect to have some sort of right uh, compensation for having done that for everyone. 
Right. You, you immediately have a problem if you're a ruler of, a, of an organized um, um, a farming system. An agricultural surplus and the distribution of that surplus requires a system. Um, it, it is no longer just who controls the surplus physically, because then it might just be the farmers who actually picked the surplus. Well, if, if you're um, a, a, a ruler in, in Sumerian, um, uh, in, in the Middle East in 8,000 years ago, you, you don't want your farmers to be able to control access to to food, because you're the ruler, that gives you're them supposed power. to. Yeah, yep. that gives them power. So power comes from access to food, to resources. That's the definition of power, in fact, for a social species. Mm -hmm. So as a ruler, you, you need a way to ensure that you control who gets food and who doesn't, basically. There's other pieces to that. Uh, and mm -hmm. to do that, there needs to be a system that allows you to enforce your will uh, on others and ensure that people don't just grab the food when they get hungry, which would kind of be the way hunter-gathering worked to a degree with all sorts of caveats and footnotes and so on and so forth there. So uh, mm -hmm. what you end up with, um, long story somewhat less long, is a legal system. A legal system exists to define the rights and responsibilities for access to limited resources in a centralized society that has a, a written system of communication. That is the textbook definition to a degree, at least my textbook, of, of what a legal system is. <laughs> it is important to note that the legal system is foundationally centered on the question of property. Th that's yes. not accidental. That That's an important distinction. When we think of the law today, a vast percentage of what we will talk about when we talk about the law has to do with property, control of property, ownership who has rights, who doesn't have rights, when rights are impinged upon. Not all, mm -hmm. but uh, but the foundational uh, framework of our legal system comes out of concerns for property. And it's important to also remember uh, one of our big issues with uh, yes. humans Absolutely. and their interactions yes. with animals is mm -hmm. that we consider them mm -hmm. in a legal sense property. Right. We have a massive problem here because most of the living world around us does not operate by the rules of human property. It, it is a an aberration what we have created in, in developing um, farming systems that have these surpluses that we want to control in a formal way. The rest of the living world doesn't work like that. So when we've developed legal systems that mostly have to do with control over property and property rights and defining property rights, we have almost inevitably and almost immediately applied them to other living beings. It just seems, in a sense, it seems inevitable. It's also horribly tragic. Like I'm raising my hands and going, right. whoa, whoa, bad idea. But we've done that all, all along. It, it, it happened right. because let's think you have about- to think that yep. part, of the, part of the religious text as the idea of us having domain has to justify us um, having domain over other species. Because otherwise- uh, Yes. These right, are two sides of one just... coin. Yeah, right. right. The, these religious systems evolved out of our newfound de uh, decision to control the reproduction of other species. I, I would say that it's it's mm -hmm. actually the, you know, the, the horse and the cart to reverse there, and that as, especially Abrahamic religions, amongst others, mm -hmm. are a byproduct mm -hmm. of the Sumerian legal systems and the development of agriculture, and religion then comes out of that at some point down the road. That is somewhat mm -hmm. of a conventional narrative in the historical space, I think, nowadays, question mark. I believe that's true. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure um, there were systems of religion before that, but the right. idea of us but being a, a, our formal legal systems that, that, as you say, mm -hmm. bring with them concepts of dominion and ownership and control over living systems. And these are uniquely the byproduct of the development of agriculture. That is that is a that is an historical <laughs> fact. Now, we don't need to look much further for for the ideological roots, the foundations of legal problems when it comes to those of us who have close um personal, intimate family connections outside of our own species, then the way that we phrase a big part of this area of the law and of ownership in, in yeah. English and in other Romance languages, we refer to a certain category of beings as livestock. Mm -hmm. We stop and unpack that word, livestock. It is stock that happens to be living. Stock is physical property, tangible goods. Mm -hmm. Livestock is they tangible often call goods. Them chattel as well. A chattel. Tangible goods that is alive but owned by somebody else as a, a piece of property, as chattel. Mm -hmm. Now, that 
that starting point where you think of livestock as as a thing that is owned, bought, sold, and traded. A thing. And, and, That's a, important. A thing. A thing. A thing. A, this not a concept, person, not no. a living being, a Qual- thing. Qualitatively different than any conception of personhood because livestock is stock that is alive. When we see the roots of our modern legal systems, especially English common law, and we think mm-hmm. of how our legal systems think about other non-human social mammals uh, of whatever species, Mm -hmm. they are either considered wildlife, which has its own background, or livestock. Livestock is a thing. Wildlife would not be owned? Wildlife stock is not, well, no, that, no, wildlife is owned in aggregate, generally owned by the crown. So, yes, Mm, wildlife gets subsumed into these systems as a meta thing that is a property that can be bought, sold, and traded. Rights to hunting then become a, a tangible chattel that that have an economic mm. value and are themselves property, which is where the development of stock markets and other such things actually has its roots in in the in the rights to control over terrain in, in a in a tradable sense. So, our mm. legal systems today, and and we go back to this like the introduction of farming because it absolutely is important to see where we stand as zoos today, to to recognize and understand and really appreciate that our legal systems are based on concepts of property. Concepts of property are driven by a transition of humanity away from the universal, unanimous way that living systems on this world have have interfaced in the past 80 80 million to 1 billion years, however long you want to say that is. Um, And and instead of a a, a system of reciprocity and interchange that I would argue is the foundation of of, of wild, um, non-formalized living systems, we develop these formalized written systems of law that have to do with the control over property. Immediately subsumed within the concept of property are other living animals. Indeed, not just other living animals, other humans quickly become property. Mm -hmm. As we know, legal systems have existed to define the rights over slaves pretty much as long as legal systems have existed. So um, mm-hmm. it isn't really possible to have slavery as a system of oppression without a legal system defining the mechanism of slavery as a system. So our legal system underlies property rights, ownership of non-humans, and ownership of humans who are denied rights to access to resources within that legal system. This is not mm-hmm. necessarily the kind of foundation that we would expect to produce spectacularly forward-looking, healthy, integrative uh, solutions to humanity's problems, and indeed it has not. Mm. So, right, mm-hmm. yeah, no, it, it, the opposite of that. So. Uh, (laughs) It's good to know when we talk about legal systems, and now we're going to jump into English legal systems in particular, we're talking about what a lot of theorists would say are fundamentally systems of oppression. That that's not an exaggeration. That kind of is a statement of fact because they are systems True, yeah. of limiting control to access to resources. That is kind of the definition of oppression. And right. the voices that don't get a say in writing those systems can still be subjected to the way the systems view them. Uh, all you have to do is look at slaves, mm-hmm. outsiders, um, um, you know, non-property holders in, in many uh, societies had no right to any input into the legal system, but were bound by the consequences of those legal systems as if they had somehow agreed to that, which they hadn't. Um, <laughs> whales never right. agreed to be part of human legal systems, and yet they end up being treated as a, a component of the way humans interface with whales. That's kind of weird. You want to see one really big example and how much it can fuck up mm-hmm. look at the Middle East where they were suddenly parts of nations that British yeah. people basically decided hey this is your oh, nation yeah. we'll get they there they promised two people uh, oh, yeah. Jerusalem oh, yeah. and yeah. welcome to the Middle East today so yeah things get ugly when you define your system uh, your, your small system that you and your buddies kind of developed or that your ancestors developed as being applicable to people outside that system that had no part in or agreement to that system, yeah, but you're still bound by it. And when push comes to shove, if you say, no, I'm not bound by it, then the answer eventually is you are bound to it, you're bound by it, or I will force you into it by violence. And we mm-hmm. see hand in glove that legal legal systems, formal legal systems, and organized violence are, are two sides of one coin. And. Uh. This is useful to say as a starting point and, and essential, I think, 
because mm-hmm. nothing about anything we've said so far with regard to legal systems, and we're still at about you know 8,000 years ago-ish, has anything to do with morality or what is right and wrong. This is not mm-hmm. what these systems are about. It's never been mm-hmm. about that, okay? It's about who has power and who controls power and who has the ability to leverage power in certain ways without needing to negotiate the implementation of that power in each individual instance. And to, to my wow. mind, that's a legal system right there. And the, the systems of power say nothing about morality until ex ante, until after the fact, then we sort of cloak them in a framing of morality. They come out of power and then we task them with moral questions. This is a bit of an odd thing yeah, to do for a system a weird, that doesn't come from that background. So as right. our legal systems evolve in Western society, and again, I am horrifically flawed in that my own academic background is Western legal system. So I, I cannot speak to outside of that. It is not to make light of that is to say my ignorance prevents that here. So in, in Western legal systems, we go from Sumerian systems um, down through the thousands of years of iterations and, and back and forth, mostly within the Middle East, and then these spread outside of the Middle East. And we end up getting to um, pre-modern to modern um, England, um, England being the island of Britain and the associated bits and pieces that come to be kind of governed by or through or as part of that world. Um, Mm -hmm. The reason that we tend to focus in on that in this discussion is that our system that we use in North America and in many other parts of the world is based on English common law. English common law itself uh, has its roots in the ways that lords and vassals uh, interfaced with each other and with access to power and violence on the British islands starting about 2,500 years ago-ish. Again, waving hands very broadly here. Um, as as that system of control to, uh, to, to resources, to food, to power, to land, to livestock, develops, we we see that turn into what is now known as English common law. These roots go back to lords enforcing their rights over serfs in England and elsewhere, and serfs having certain breakpoints where they would not accept further constraints and pushed back through revolution and rebellion. Mm. And the stable state equilibrium that we now got to eventually-ish, the Magna Carta and so forth, that's English common law. We are the the descendants, legally speaking, of that system of, of push and push back between those with access to power, the 1%, we would say, kind of in modern parlance, and those without access to power. That has been but codified... A vastly greater number, but uh, lacking in, in, in political, economic, and social power and control. Uh, and our right. our modern legal systems, all of which we we trace to, from which we trace uh, the roots in English common law, are based on those kinds of access to and control of power. It, it, this is not an unusual statement; it's a statement of fact. In these systems, non-human beings and and ecosystems and families and lives are property or they're nothing. There isn't a third category. And we have slavery, by the way, throughout all of those systems until quite recently. Human slavery was fit perfectly into those systems and was legal and was enforced and was part of why those systems existed. So anybody today who says that the law exists to implement morality is telling us that for the last 8,000 years, slavery was morally justifiable and only suddenly became unjustifiable in the last 100 years. That's an absurd argument to make. And it is absurd to say that the law exists to represent morality because it's never been intended to do that. It is a trailing, uh, I think, a trailing indicator of, of where our moral standards go. And the fact that slavery has been acceptable to our English um, legal systems is is something that must be constantly kept in mind when we're thinking about how we look at non-humans and quote unquote right. livestock, because if if we think it's okay what we do to non-humans because it's legal, then we also have to acknowledge that it was okay to do slavery for thousands of years because that was legal too. So that was okay, right? No. If that's mm. not okay, then we cannot conflate legal with moral 
Conversely, we cannot conflate illegal with immoral. These are two different Correct. areas of discussion, right? So that is sort right. of the... I the, mean, if you start doing that, then you have to just say that, you know, gay is immoral, and it, or at least it was for... Yes. What? Thousands, Mis like, miscegenation. Like, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, until not more, much more than 50 years ago, marrying someone mm -hmm. with different skin color than you in the United States was a crime. It's illegal. A crime. Okay, so mm -hmm. was that... More was that immoral to do, and then suddenly became moral the day that those laws were repealed? That's an absurd statement to make because where did that shift suddenly happen? Well, it happened in a different uh, a different context, and the law eventually caught up. Right. So, right. Um, uh, many theoreticians of the law and the way the law affects uh, living beings outside of humanity uh, will argue strongly and convincingly that our property-based systems of law are, 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 are constitutionally incapable of addressing the rights of beings who are alive and have interests, but who are not human. Mm. That's a big deal. Um, that's a big right. issue of, I think, research and activism with, within not only animal rights law, but with within the law more broadly, because we have right. problems of you, ecosystem about, rights, you know? Right, think about <clears throat> animal rights and think about, we do these things because they're moral, but then we don't enforce them in a way that suggests that they're not property. Right, because they are property under the law. Right, because as far as the law is concerned, you know, you can't, uh, you know, you can't abuse an animal, right. but at the end of the day, you could kill one, and the the recourse for doing that would be property law. You well, have to pay me for the value of that dog that yeah, you there's, shot. There's a famous saying in the law that a dog is a dishwasher. Which is not to make that sound right. It is to say that to our modern legal systems, a, a dog is a piece of property, is chattel, right. in the same right. way that a dishwasher is. These are these are categorically identical concepts under law, and uh, we have added some filigrees in recent centuries to that. I, 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 you mm -hmm. can cite, you can sort of trace those back to Albert Schweitzer, who is a is a. a, a philosopher and theorist, social theorist in, in the 1800s, who starts arguing that being cruel to, to other beings, other living beings, especially, you know, domestic animals like dogs, is, is qualitatively wrong and evil. So then we take our legal system that treats a dog as a dishwasher and say, mm -hmm. okay, so a dog is a dishwasher, but it's like, it's a dishwasher that you're not allowed to do certain things to, and, unless you are, right. and, and, unless we feel like it, unless you can make money from it, in which case it's totally okay to do it. But if you're not, like, so all of that right. is, is sort of cobbled onto the foundation that a dog is a dishwasher. In our legal system, dogs and everybody else on the planet are treated as property, as things. It is, it is a tragic reality that every um, activist in animal rights law faces uh, every minute of every day the fundamental decision to be made there is do we accept the fact that our legal systems treat other living things as property and continue to try to refine the way we treat that property or do we reject the treatment of other people as property in the same way that we eventually rejected the treatment of other human beings as property and require our legal systems to reframe around a new concept of people who are not human and that's a huge um, ongoing uh, debate. Uh, wi there are within... some some instances where that is being done. Yes, for instance, it is. often dolphins in some well, well legal said. areas yes. are considered well, people. Basically, mm -hmm. they're called people. They're non-human people. There is a theoretician named um, Stephen Wise, who is a, a brilliant legal mind, who works with the Non-Human Rights Project. Um, for, for research, or for other for listeners interested in this this. Um, more technical discussion of the law. Uh, Stephen Wise and his team at that in that group are absolutely at the leading edge of this. And what is interesting is that uh, Mr. Wise and others who are working that front line have essentially been forced to concede the reality of property-based systems because it's so hard to change them. And and their argument right. it's is so is, ingrained. Like it, yeah, if like you, you think about the implications of changing humans or not like non-humans into people, as right. far as our laws right. are concerned, right? You you basically up upheave an entire e everything. Yeah, you everything. Really, everything. You, everything changes. You have to, right? You can't yeah. keep going. And, and look at how hard it was for us, for example, in in the United States, uh, to 
to strip out from the law the concept of human beings as property, um, right. nearly destroyed the country, caused a civil war, took a hundred years of after effects to actually implement, is still mm -hmm. not well implemented. We continue to have right. deep racism in this. Like, th that mm -hmm. is a sub-segment. Right, so mm -hmm. doing that for humans was that hard. Imagine how hard it is to try to cobble together a, a path forward where we recognize that a dolphin is not a dishwasher. She is a person and she has interests and rights and somehow our system needs to encompass that. Well, if we decide that, okay, she is in fact a person and she is not a thing, everything turns upside down. And, and uh, as, as an activist, I, I love that concept of everything turning upside down. As, as someone right. interested in the law, I look at it and go, I don't know how you actually make that happen. That really, like, right. wow, that's very difficult. So what Stephen Wise and his team and others in that space have done is they're looking to implement property-based systems with qualitatively different components added to them in order to protect non-humans from the worst abuses that humans uh, cause to them. And I think mm. that work is compelling and important, and it is good for us as zoos to know that others out there are trying to recognize the legitimacy and viability and personhood and, and relevance of, of non-human people in, in a powerful, compelling, important, um, life-affirming way we come at it from our family structure and from who we are. They come at it from their moral foundations and sometimes also from their family structure because there are more than a few who also are most likely zoos in real life, That's though, right. not, though not publicly so. And together right. we are talking about the same challenges. And as zoos, the, the, the fact that the law is currently uh, treating us as if we're a problem to be solved is is in, is the the most spectacular form of um, projection because we're actually some of the folks out there who know the foundational fundamental limitations and and failures of the law in dealing with the people who we love, many of whom are outside of the human species. So there are other um, theorists and activists who share those concerns and they are fellow, um, I, I think fellow travelers on this path we are not opposed to those activists. We are aligned structurally with those activists. Efforts mm -hmm. to keep us feeling as if we are enemies are absolutely, as Toggle has pointed out before, intended to marginalize and and uh, and factionalize those individuals who are standing up against and resisting the destruction of our planet by people who couldn't care less about dishwashers or anything else. Yeah, I feel like I'm. <laughs> you just see. You guys should see me. I'm just like sitting here, like <laughs> yes. Yes, he is doing that. I'm like yes. that that person in the church is like, yes, Lord. Yes, yes. Yeah, I am oh. actually channeling Toggle in in what I'm saying at this particular <laughs> point, which is probably why he's not yes. interrupting me as much because I am speaking Toggle here, and <laughs> mm, and his yeah. his critique and his analysis there is is absolutely spot on. The mm -hmm. foundational, academic, historical roots of our legal systems tell us who we are in the eyes of those systems, and who our allies and enemies are in terms of. Uh, evolving or refining or improving those systems to respect not just our rights and integrity as zoos, but the rights of those who we love and who we respect as peers and as family members who happen to be outside the human species. Mm -hmm. These historical roots are empirical reality. They're not opinions. And understanding the empirical reality of the law is essential for those who face the law in tangible practice, in tactical reality, even in a courtroom, because the law can be misconstrued, misapplied, mislabeled, and, and misused in massive ways, misused. as we've all seen. And we are yes. targets of that right now. We are not the we first targets are. of the misuse of English law, nor shall we be the last, unfortunately. No, we are indeed. one of many, and we come by it with honorable, deep roots activists fighting oppression have fought English legal standards for millennia. That is the reality of <laughs> That is the reality activism. of activism. Activism is fighting that system. And seeking better futures that, that use systems to benefit everyone on this planet instead of harming almost everyone for mm -hmm. the benefit of a very tiny selection of people who benefit. Yes. That All is, activism is that. Yes. All and, activism. And I can't think of a single bit of activism that is not that. So when we talk about zoos 
um, pushing back ag against persecution of us and our families and other non-humans because of who we are and our sexual orientation, we stand in a, a tradition of activism and challenge to the failures of English common law that goes back uh, longer than England goes back as as a culture and as a society. This is this Elk, is the, yeah. this is the right thing to do. These systems. Fuck the system. <laughs> what, yeah, but what I'll say as yeah, a legal theorist, I'll though. agree with Toggle in principle because fuck the yes, system. yes, because FTP and and yes, definitely fuck the system. As a legal theorist, I will say break the system so that we can fix it and make it work better we do need systems mm -hmm. we share a planet with a lot of other humans and we need a way to work together that that is effective and result in good outcomes positive outcomes for everybody mm -hmm. that matter that 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 requires us to agree to certain things collectively and that is a legal system so we need better legal systems we, do, we don't need broken legal systems we need improved legal systems and that requires mm -hmm. activism in the service of improvements to our systems and the fact mm -hmm. that we as zoos are on the receiving end of of a shitty um, treatment of our current legal systems is neither surprising nor unusual nor unexpected in any sense we we are right. we are voices for those without voices as zoos That's what that is saying. who we are activists are yes. voices or louder voices for people who don't have voices that right. is exactly what activists do yes those who those who control the the levers of power which is to say that the, the legal systems um, mm -hmm. uh, do do not take kindly on those from outside that control who decide to change the rules in ways that don't benefit those who control the rules. It, 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 none mm -hmm. of this is surprising. Um, if if <laughs> I have a, you know a, w one particular dog in my family and she loves a particular sofa and she passes a rule that henceforth she's the only one ever allowed on the sofa ever again forever in history. Amen. And everybody else in the family is like, yeah, no, we're not really buying into that rule because that rule's stupid. She's going to be like, no, you don't get the right to change that rule because we passed this rule. And everybody else says, no, he didn't. You just unilaterally decided it's your sofa and we don't agree. Well, yeah, welcome to a legal debate. This this is this is legal <laughs> formalism. It, it's not unique to us. Doesn't need language. And as zoos who, who see particular examples of absurdity in the application of our laws today, yeah, that happens. It's not unusual. <laughs> you know, I'm just yeah. thinking like another place where that you see that shit is like on the playground when you were a kid. Yeah. Some kids like the right. floor is New lava. Rule. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the floor is <laughs> lava. Rule. That's right. New rule. Floor is lava. <laughs> you can't, can't touch walk the floor. Over here. If you touch the yeah. floor, you're dead. Right. And also, everyone's like, uh, but also I get your I lunch. Get, I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. I get your lunch. Yeah. <laughs> also, I get your lunch. No, that's a stupid rule. I didn't pass that rule. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't disagree with it, and I said it was passed, and therefore it's passed. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now we're into a question of like motions practice and stuff, and, and there, these are that's where future lawyers come from. So, yeah, we, and and that that as zoos we see laws that are that are not only amoral but immoral in many regards. Not unusual. Mm. Not a surprise. Does not reflect poorly on us. Um, those who fought slavery, abolitionists who fought slavery for centuries, were mm. labeled as horrific, uh, disgusting, uh, filth-loving mm. monsters who wanted to mm. bring down society and who slept with, you know, with with beasts and blah 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 blah. Does this sound mm. familiar? Well, it should because it is because being branded. A, a, a rebel in the eyes of hegemonized central power when that central mm. power mm. is resulting in horrific outcomes like mm. destroying life on our planet, well, you damn well better be a rebel, because if you're not a rebel, guess what? You're part of destroying life on this planet. Yeah, time to oh, rebel man. a little when bit when you from talk that. about rebelling against hegemony, oh, yeah, God. Oh, wow, Toggle, that's a, oh, is that, yes. a, you know, is that hegemony in your pocket, <laughs> or are you just happy to see me? Because, holy <laughs> crap, that's, you know, definitely know how to speak yeah. dirty to Toggle when you, when you sit with him, is, just talk about, you know, fighting talk the power the and the overthrow of hegemony, and you are speaking his language. Um, and and Hell also, yes. I have to say, though I do not show the tumescence that Toggle does in such regards, be because I'm old and broken down, but um, I also agree that we must fight the hegemony because we must improve the system behind it. And, and, and this is where I think we can start to talk about, at least in brief form, before we conclude this introductory episode, a little bit about the mechanics of how the law works in our system, because before we can improve 
the system in which we live and in which our loved ones live, we have to understand how it works. That doesn't mean we agree with it. That doesn't mean that we're, we're honoring it by saying that it is inevitable or the right way. It does mean that it is useful to know how it works before we find a way to make it better. So mm -hmm. the two distinctions I wanted to introduce prior to wrapping up this introductory episode, the first one I will emphasize is the distinction between statutory and common law. I, I bring this up because it is really simple and it is not complicated and it is not magical and you don't have to be a lawyer to understand it. We've been talking about legal systems and um, written have legal we? systems. Indeed, we have oh, uh, to good. a degree and fighting the power and hegemony and two messes oh, yeah. and, and other related concepts. Stuff. Yeah, that is that is the good stuff. So it's in there. Right. Yeah. Uh, there, there's two different ways in the English legal systems that we come to have what we refer to as laws. Um, you can say capital L law, lowercase law, whatever. Uh, uh, rules that are enforced through the centralized use of power. How about that as, as a definition of what a law is? So hmm. the two ways that we end up with law in the systems governed by English common law are as follows. In the old ways, before the new school systems started to happen, um, common law developed in English systems by judges and magistrates and lawyers and advocates and and, uh, and and lords and peers and all these other people arguing about shit. And they argued and argued and argued. And when somebody made a particularly compelling argument, they wrote his argument down. It was his because only men. They wrote his argument down, gave it a title, and that became law. That is common law. And it's like the shit that you got told in school that everybody kind of knows and agrees to, but nobody ever really officially formally voted on. That's common law. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff in our systems that are that is based on that kind of law. That's weird, sort of. Like, really? <laughs> so how do you learn that stuff? You yeah. go to law school, basically. So in other words, basically, a bunch of people talked about it. We kind of said, yeah, okay. And no one else got to really have any say in that kind of it wasn't yeah. voted on yeah it, it was, was never just, officially voted okay, on yeah, there, let's there just was do that. yeah there was there was never like a, a a representative who sat in a in a in a in a house of representatives or in a senate and officially passed that common law oftentimes when you go way back in common law it was a particular magistrate wearing a fancy weird white wig who um, heard an argument by a particular advocate or lawyer in a particular court in, in some tiny, you know, a windblown corner of the English empire and said, man, that's a really great argument. I'm going to go ahead and write that down. Yeah, guess what? 800 years later, that argument that got written down by that magistrate with that wig on ends up affecting your life. That's real. So that's common mm -hmm. law. It's it's kind of like the dark energy or the dark matter of English legal systems. It's out there, but hard to measure. The part that we tend mm -hmm. to think about more, though it's it's not the only part, is, is what's called statutory law. Statutory law are laws that are written, passed, debated, and brought into effect in a formal mechanism by some kind of representative body, like a senator, a house of representatives, or a house of lords, or a house of commons, or what have you. Um, statutory law is what is what we often are looking at when we say, hey, a new law just got passed. Well, that's because there's a new statute. Mm -hmm. A written law right. that gets passed in this formal way is called a statute. That's it. So if it's written down and passed formally, it's statutory law. If it is just sort of accreted over the centuries and is something that everybody kind of sort of agrees to, it's common law. That's it. That's the distinction. There's no more and no less. One type of law doesn't win over the other. One isn't stronger than the other. They interact with each other in this complicated, totally nonlinear, messy way. Welcome to the English legal system. That's it. So you've got um, your masters now. Yeah, that that's uh, <laughs> it's other places in the world don't have that weird common law. That's an English concept. And here we are. The other critical right. distinction, one that I think is is more important to us in daily life and that may generate more questions and discussions here is the distinction between civil and criminal law in, in the context mm. of our legal systems. Yes. Would you say, Toggle, that you have a, a, a confidence that you understand which of those things is which? No. 
Okay, well said. Okay, what, what would your? <laughs> I, I, I appreciate think, when when people this. answer by saying I'm not entirely sure. That's that is the right answer, actually. And the, the <laughs> follow up to that, because nobody actually is. The the, the punchline here is there, there isn't a distinction because they gray into each other, and there's no bright line between the two. When you think of those two types of law, how would you describe one versus the other? Mm. Yeah, it is actually. Infor- so I think criminal law maybe enforcing sorts of laws like enforcing things they're punishing people mm. and then i would think maybe civil is like protecting people if only it were true uh, that sounds like <laughs> a much better answer than the answer that's actually true um, um however in criminal law we have things like fines that involve purely monetary issues so criminal law isn't always about like you know punishment or enforcing and in civil law we can put people in prison and enforce stuff uh, civil statute or rather uh, civil subpoenas and uh, contempt of court citations in civil court actually result in imprisonment. They blur into each other in uncomfortable ways because historically mm. there was no such distinction. That is why this is kind of a new-ish concept, but has become mm. incredibly important in how our legal systems actually operate. So it, it, every argument about a legal question in the English system involves a lawsuit. A lawsuit is one person who is the plaintiff, person, group of people, organization, all the same thing, um, and one person who is the defendant. This is true in civil civil law and criminal law, and our system mm-hmm. is built on an argument within the context of a lawsuit, and there's a winner and there's a loser, and then the courts enforce the outcome. In in modern systems, uh, English systems, a criminal law is is uh, has as the plaintiff the government. And the defendant is, is a person, a human, and, and a human mm. being, or can be a corporation. Actually, though, rarely is that it's that used, and that's a whole another fascinating area. No oh boy. So, if like myself, you have ever been targeted for criminal prosecution by the United States federal government, the actual case under which that occurs is the United States of America versus. Douglas B. Spake. Don't tell anybody that's my name because it's a secret, but it is. Um, <laughs> and. That is a lawsuit that the United States government has brought against a person, me. Now, that is a criminal action in that it's enforcing a section of statutory law that is labeled criminal, but it really is just a lawsuit, actually. And it's a lawsuit that ends up with you going to prison. So it's a really bad kind of lawsuit, but it's a lawsuit. So, mm-hmm. a, a, again, a, a criminal matter in, in our systems is a matter in which the plaintiff is some level of government. So um, mm. those those cases are brought by a representative of a government, which in the way they have evolved in modern uh, practice is a prosecutor. That's a whole weird right. another argument for Ugh. how that happened. Fucking, Don't get me started on that. Uh, that is very yeah. weird. It did not used to be true. You used to be able Ugh. to bring criminal cases as as private citizens. That has been taken away because corporations really hated that. That is a fascinating yeah, I bet they did, history. It is. Yeah. Fa- and also, there are still some states where you can bring private prosecutions, Pennsylvania being one of them. Lo and behold, Uh that is a thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, rabbit hole down, which we will not go today. Civil law, in contrast, involves lawsuits where the plaintiff and the defendant are private citizens or corporations or Mm -hmm. some version thereof. Now, there are exceptions like everything else in our legal systems where a civil case can be brought by the United States government because it's it's not enforcing criminal law, it's enforcing maybe civil administrative sanctions. Um, Environmental Protection Act, for example, could be a, a civil lawsuit brought by the US government. But for the most part, when we think about somebody suing somebody else in court, or we think about, y- you know, uh, uh, things on TV, where there's I'm a, gonna a, sue you. A, I'm gonna sue you, right? And, you know, uh, personal injury lawyers, you know, sue and win millions. These are all civil lawsuits because the parties, the plaintiffs and the defendants are, are not, um, governments, they're, they're private citizens, as the phrase would be. So uh, mm-hmm. as zoos, th- there are times when that distinction becomes really, really important and complicated and kind of dysfunctional in our, in our world because some members of our families are treated as property. Okay, mm. so we go back to dogs are dishwashers. If your dog is a dishwasher and there's a problem with your dishwasher, the civil legal system kind of exists to deal with property issues like that. So you can end up with zoos getting entangled in civil lawsuits because your loved one is a thing according to the law, not a person. 
If somebody kidnaps mm. my partner, which has happened to me before more than once, violently mm. breaks into my home and abducts my loved one from my home and holds them hostage and will only return them if large sums of money are given to them or they will face violence, if that person who I love has four legs instead of two. It's a civil matter. It is a civil matter, right, which is terrible because it kind of should be a criminal matter if somebody abducts a family member of yours and holds them hostage for ransom. That's like quintessentially a criminal act, right? Well, mm. if your loved one has four legs, it might not be. It might be a civil act. Whereas if your loved one has two legs, then oh hell yeah, that's a criminal act. You can't abduct people and hold them against their will. Unless those people have four legs, in which case you can do whatever you want because they're a dishwasher and you have to sue under civil law to try to get them back. As zoos, we know, unfortunately, sometimes how arbitrary and broken the distinction between civil and criminal law can be. Mm. If, if you are a zoo who is ever entangled in legal questions, that's a good place to start thinking about what's happening to you and or your family. If somebody's threatening you in some way with some legal something and they can't explain to you whether they're threatening you with civil or criminal action, the technical term I would use for who they are, they are full of shit. Because <laughs> th there's no way, if they don't know which of the two they're threatening you with, then they're full of shit. They'd have no idea what they're talking about. So um, th those are the big distinctions in, in thinking about the law, statutory versus common law, cr criminal versus civil law. There's gray zone, you know, between each one. There's statutory criminal law. There's common law that governs civil actions. There's common law that governs criminal acts, blah, 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 blah. Welcome to the English legal system. It all turns into a big snarl. <laughs> and it employs lots of lawyers. The fact that lawyers write our laws and it's very complicated and requires a lot of lawyers to run, eh, well, you can draw your own conclusions there. That's probably not an accident. <laughs> so that is essentially my introduction to legal systems. Our follow-up episodes dive in a little more deeply to civil questions and criminal questions, respectively, as they tend to uh, come up in the context of, of being zoos and being members of our community. Before we wrap up, Toggle, would you have questions, follow up, or commentary to provide at this point? I mean, honestly, I you know I am just now hearing this, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm True. a listener just like you are, yeah, everybody. So I, I you know I find this actually really fascinating um, because you, there's some of these things that you kind of get the sense you like know them, mm -hmm. but you don't have a way of putting them into words, right? So, well such as the, the the way that our law treats animals, you know the the whole the whole discussion for me was um, actually really really interesting, and I hope that everyone found it as interesting as I did because I'm sitting over here like yes yes preach motherfucker. One of the things that we will notice immediately is that in this introduction, I don't believe other than mentioning miscegenation laws, which were laws that prevented people with black skin from having intimate relations with people with white skin, just to be clear for mm. those listeners who cannot even imagine that such a thing was a thing. Oh, it was a thing. No, it was. And people went to prison for it, and it was very, very aggressively enforced in the United States and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and miscegenation yeah, apartheid was... apartheid was a thing. Yep, apartheid was a thing until very recently. Um, mm -hmm. uh, nowhere in this discussion have I mentioned sex. Now... Those who have been listening along and following Toggle's uh, uh, perspective on this probably are not terribly surprised because you look at this and go, yeah, so the law has to do mostly with property stuff and with power and control over property and sex, like actual sex between adults who are healthy and who actually care about each other and all the stuff that comes with sex, not just human sex, but sex more broadly. And it's not a property-based thing. It's a sharing-based thing. You love someone and you share and, and, and you feel empathy and, and, and you celebrate that connection. This isn't property. So our legal systems probably 
don't really have a lot of comfort dealing with sex. True. Yes, you win bonus points true. because that's true. When our legal systems <laughs> tend to get involved in the question of sex, they get it wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, because a lot of this stuff is really arbitrary, to be yes, honest. Yes, because it doesn't fit in a property context. So, for example, women in English common law um, societies for many centuries and millennia were treated as property when it came to the question of sex. They couldn't say no right. to their husband because they were chattel. And as chattel, they had no rights to decisions about their bodies or intimacy relating to their bodies. Mm -hmm. That is how the legal system perceived and implemented the question of sex between straight human beings. Not exactly an ideal moral stance, we would say, in today's day and age. Indeed, many people <laughs> over many centuries looked at that and went, that's the fucking dumbest thing I've that's ever seen. It was fucked up, man. Yeah, it was. The fuck is this it, shit? Was, it was totally fucked up. It was fucked up all the way along, and people knew it was fucked up. Our legal system doesn't do a great job dealing with questions of sex because our legal system is built to talk about property, and sex is anti property. So mm. here we are as zoos, and our, our question of intimacy and sexuality entangles with a broken piece of our legal system that has to do with treating other non-human beings as property and then you make you know add sex on top of that which our legal system has traditionally done a shitty job of dealing with guess what mm -hmm. yeah we see all sorts of bad things in the law so we'll be talking more about that when we talk about civil and criminal law and um, mm -hmm. we will be exploring a little more how we got to where we are today in terms of zoos being treated as if we are a problem rather than part of the solution to what has gone wrong with our societies and how we work with the rest of the world. I'm excited. I am too. Empowerment in the context of legal questions comes from one's comfort in learning about how our legal systems work. The more you mm. learn and the more you understand about our laws, the good and the bad, the more you will feel to be an active participant in the system and the less you will be um, a, a, a helpless victim of these systems. Absolutely. Also, Doug's middle name is Beauregard. It is true. Uh, that is really, really uncomfortable because it suggests that I have some kind of connection to the South and oh my God, I do not <laughs> because those people are truly weird. Yes, all of them. There are no exceptions. And, uh, and they lost the goddamn war, just to be clear. Did not win, lost. So it's over. Get over it. Anyway, this is... I'm all. sorry, this was the war of Northern aggression. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I, I'm adding a satire tag expressly to that entire sentence because that was actually satire. However, I am actually a Northerner, so that is definitely true and that is actually my middle name so you can take that to the bank because we would never tell you something untrue about me on a podcast like this <laughs> all right take us out fausty and with that zoish colleagues we've shared yet another chunk of your time through this uniquely dangerous entertainment known as zooier than thou our next episode just around the corner celebrates thanksgiving with our exploration of our communities non-zoo allies that'd be the american flavor of thanksgiving since the real thanksgiving passed many weeks <laughs> ago and we are not going back in time just for a replay of that are we <laughs> thank you fausty for yet another gratuitous canadian reference <laughs> what would we ever do without them <laughs> dog nose toggle only dog nose in any case this next episode really is going to be well worth the wait, so don't miss it for anything. Especially don't miss it by participating in a gratuitous genocide of the previous human inhabitants of Turtle Island, and then generating a slew of holidays celebrating the crime, since that's really weird, and also would probably conflict with all the current holidays already celebrating just that genocide. Nope. Definitely don't miss it for that, especially not that. And as long as you're not committing genocide, you can subscribe directly to Zooier Than Thou via our very own RSS feed. Just point your favorite podcast client at rss.zoo.wtf and off you go. In addition, you can hook up with us on YouTube, Alexa, Spotify, and that place where Steve Jobs got fired back in the day. We're also listed in a bunch of other podcasty directory resources, but... 
If you have a favorite place for podcasts and you don't see Zuria the Now listed there, drop us a note so we can work our astonishing Zoo-ish magics and make sure your favorite Zoo podcast makes an appearance. Actually, we'll just submit our RSS feed to the directory manually, but astonishing Zoo-ish magics really does sound way more impressive, Ooh. doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Magics. <laughs> Since you wrote that line, it's sure, Fausty, it's amazingly impressive. Such a great line. Glad to know you've got my back, my furry little friend, Toggle. (laughs) Also, our podcast website continues to be found at zoo.wtf. We all now actually remember why we named it that, but the story is too sordid and embarrassing to share publicly, so you'll just have to trust us that it seemed like a good idea at the time. Speaking of things that had good idea written all over them at the time, (laughs) our Twitter handle remains (laughs) at Zooier Than Thou, and you can follow Zooey's Naughty with a K, get it? advice at ask z-o-o-e-y i'm on twitter since about a decade ago at l-e-c-o-n-t-e-s-p-i-n-k sometimes i actually post useful stuff there though mostly it's mr peanut butter porn and obscure references to ancient rock climbing history so fair warning (laughs) toggle is found at one big grumpy rat where my esteemed co-host routinely provides more useful stuff in a day than i have done in my first decade on twitter combined (laughs) oh If you're in an emailish kind of mood, but don't want to fire up a proper client application, Fausty wrote that line, obviously. <laughs> I did. We have a form that enables anonymous submissions to the podcast on our website, zoo.wtf. You can also email us at zooierthannow at gmail.com or at mail at zoo.wtf. Okay. It is something of a tradition at this point for me to interrupt my co-host Toggle here with a mind-numbingly boring reference <laughs> to the ambiguity in spoken English between male as in postal and male as in gender. But I'm getting genuinely worried that Toggle might actually kill me in my sleep if I keep doing that. So that actually makes it a lot more fun and exciting. And without further ado... Toggle. Is that mail as in what the postman delivers if you're old school like me? Or mail as in gifted with testicles, bad judgment, and a proclivity for linear thinking? It's mail as in killing you in your sleep sounds like a decent <laughs> idea now that you mentioned it, Fausty. <laughs> Uh-oh. But our listeners can send email to us at either version and will receive it. That's Fausty well knows since he set up our whole email infrastructure in the first place. <laughs> That's true. Or they can use the bit message address included in each episode's show notes via the RSS feed. Fausty loves bit message. Mm, bit message. Anyhow, you can join me in making fun of Fausty for being old. Ask Zooey what happened to Ask Zooey this episode. <laughs> or issue a malform subpoena that Fausty will gleefully ignore. I will. You can also contact your gray muzzled co host Fausty through an endless list of alternative methods listed on my website, Fausty.org, or you could just show up at the edge of some low, underhung cliff face, and I'll probably appear eventually to make a base jump from it, and we can chat about wind direction, canopy inflation physics, or the state <laughs> of provincial politics in Quebec, if that's your thing. When not busy scoping out awesome new dodgy base exit points or following (laughs) Quebec politics, you can share Zoot, Zooier Than Thou, via our shiny new links, spotify.zoo.wtf, castbox.zoo.wtf, youtube.zoo.wtf, geocities.zoo.wtf we're particularly proud of our geocity site it's quite nice etc etc it is our honor and privilege to confirm that absolutely all non-humans who participated in the production and distribution of this episode of zero than thou had better things to do with their time but they graciously agreed to share their wisdom with us even so we are all the better for it as is always the case don't look a gift horse in the mouth because that's rude and besides he's got other bits a good deal more intriguing to share than the inside of his mouth, you silly fool. We have been fine-tuning our Help Save My Dog campaign since its launch a few episodes back. In addition to raising enough money to get Lucy back on her feet and get her an MRI, we're on track to fund the rest of her surgery and really get her on her feet for good. If you haven't done so already, take a minute to visit the website that is helpsavemy.dog. And if you'd like to amplify your own contributions to the campaign, please do share that with your friends and colleagues as well. We're going to get this done as a community. Thanks to everyone who has pitched in to save Lucy from a life of paralysis after being shot by a deranged neighbor. On behalf of the entire team who works behind the scenes to make Zooier Than Thou a reality every two weeks, this is your zooiest of zoos, Fausty, sharing our best wishes for you and your beloved family this Thanksgiving season. Until our next episode, stay strong, stay safe, stay true to yourself, and never forget kindness. 
Being kind is the zooiest, most awesome thing you can do in this life or the next. And this is Toggle, CEO of the Rodents Are Awesome fan club, and so much more besides. And you're just about through with listening to episode 9.0 of Zooier Than Thou. Stay defiant, fellow zoos. We'll see you next time you feel like howling at the moon. Aroo! I still can't howl, but I'll pretend like I can. <laughs> what kind of a dog are you? <laughs> Not a very good one. Bad dog. <laughs> Bad dog. No biscuit. <laughs> Bad dog. Bad dog. I'm a very, very bad dog. Rawr.